Well, it's yeah, it's any, a thrill and an honor to be here with you guys. Like, frankly, I'm just so pleased. <laughs> this is really nice. <laughs> Maxwell, it's an absolute pleasure uh, to have you here today. And I, I want to thank you for coming on the show because you're one of the uncommon type of combinations that I that I love talking to and find, you know, so enlightening, which is a philosopher who's also fluent in mathematics. And I think that brings an, an interesting rigor, you know, to the philosophy. And then there's actually like a really cool interplay between philosophy and mathematics and science. So I think I think you gain a lot as a philosopher, the more science and math you know, and vice versa, you gain a lot as a scientist and a mathematician, the more philosophy you know. Well, th thanks very much for your kind words. Um, I'm inclined to uh, agree that uh, philosophy and formal training go uh, hand in hand. And you know that it is something of a strange historical circumstance that we we don't think of philosophy as a very formal discipline anymore. Uh, you know, if if you mm. went back a hundred years, uh, some of the there main was no there was no separation. No, absolutely. Years ago, there was no distinction between science and philosophy, right? Absolutely. Think back to the Principia Mathematica, right? Uh, you know, uh, Russell and Whitehead, uh, philosopher mathematicians, uh, you know, the, it was very common back in the day and uh, less so now, but, you know, let, let's hope that uh, the trend is reversing. Uh, I, I'm definitely optimistic about this. I think uh, I, I increasingly uh, find myself uh, surrounded by a very technical uh, colleagues who also have uh, strong philosophical backgrounds. Uh, so, uh, yeah, ho hopefully things are uh, changing for the better. Yeah, and, you know, it's, it's interesting. I, I'm going to take the time to ask you, since you are, you know, a philosopher, like by, by education, and, and I mean no offense, folks, to, to philosophers mm -hmm. whatsoever, because I think science has lost out on losing losing philosophy, and philosophy has lost out on losing science and like mm. the the rigor that you know confirming your thoughts against reality uh can have i mean do you find that to be the case which is that i find that a lot of philosophers you know without that grounding kind of in in science and mathematics they spend a lot of time pontificating really about things that just amount to the to the vagaries and ambiguity of like natural language mm. rather than than being able to map it to something symbolic something concrete you know mm. Well, um, so I think uh, I think it depends what kind of philosophy we're talking about. Um, I mean, in in general, I think uh, the, the ultimate problem is the being a philosopher of science is difficult because you have to be a philosopher and a scientist. Um, and usually, right. when when you're training, you can only do one PhD. Uh, so I mean, I think to be like a proper <laughs> philosopher of science you know you would have to be familiar with the the history of philosophy and contemporary philosophy of science and also uh to get some proper training in the discipline upon upon which you are you know uh, uh, directing your reflections um and so you know it, it, in my case uh i had to do a lot of um kind of training on my own so my my uh, most of my coursework uh, was in philosophy and cognitive science, and so the 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 more formal stuff that I wield, uh, I've had to teach myself as a kind of side job. So, like when I was doing, you know, my masters and my PhD uh, in philosophy and cogsci, I would also be teaching myself math uh, on the side. And I think that you know, to mm -hmm. to 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 uh, you know, exist effectively at these intersections, you, you can't help but uh, get some multidisciplinary training. And I, you know, I think a good philosopher of science is necessarily a polymath yeah. in some sense. Like you, you, you need, well, I think thank you're you. absolutely right. And I think that's, that is what makes it, that is what makes it a kind of a rare breed, mm. right? Like, uh, you know, like one of my favorite uh, philosophers of, of mathematics is uh, Eric Curiel. And, mm. he, and he has so much great you know, content on, on general relativity and mathematics and philosophy in general. But like you say, there are these rare, these rare combinations and, or it takes a lot of self-study, you know, to mm. develop that. That's right. Yeah. Um, and I mean, you know, topics like the free energy principle and active inference are inherently multidisciplinary. So it's, 
it's beyond just like the philosophy and the math uh you know what if if you're in some sense if you're doing it well <laughs> then uh insights from every discipline will wind up making contributions to the way that you're thinking uh fep theoretically so um yeah uh hmm. but i um this is one of the things that I love the most about uh, our intellectual community uh, around the FEP and active inference is the multidisciplinary, the multidisciplinary nature of it, um, and that's sort of unavoidable, mm. right? Um, so it, you know, the, the free energy principle, uh, which we'll be discussing uh, today, is uh, an explanatory principle that that its proponents, at least, purport applies to uh, every scale at which physical systems self-organize and therefore uh you know insights from all of the different disciplines working on on all the different kinds of things uh become relevant and and it, the fep then acts as a kind of like meta theoretical architecture to fit these claims together uh in a way that's tractable uh from a physics and from a mathematics perspective well one of my earliest childhood memories is um understanding how Cartesian coordinates work when I was, uh, I guess, uh, uh, yeah, 11 or 12 years old, uh, kind of really like understanding the mechanics of that and going like, wow, like there are disciplines where there are exact answers to the questions that we have. Um, and so, yeah, I was always uh, very into the sciences and math, but I, I've also always been very interested in the big questions um, and by the time I was done with high school, uh, I, would, I, I was either going into um, uh, philosophy, uh, physics, or film. And so uh, <laughs> I ended up deciding to go into philosophy, and I, uh, I remained a physics and math geek throughout. Uh, so I, I'm self-taught in a lot of ways. Uh, and uh, yeah, I ended up specializing in philosophy and cognitive science. The philosophy of cognitive science and uh, formal approaches in cognitive science, in particular, uh, you know, when I was doing my undergrad, uh, the uh, embodied, inactive, embedded, extended traditions mm -hmm. in cognitive science were very hot, um, and so I, uh, I learned some dynamical systems theory, uh, um, and I was very into ecological psychology, which is uh, a branch of psychology that uh, attempts to apply principles from physics to understand action perception loops. So I was very into all of this cluster um, of ideas. And um, around late 2014, early 2015, I was exposed to the free energy principle and the ideas of Carl Friston, um, in part uh, by reading uh, this, this really wonderful and by now seminal paper of Andy Clark's called Whatever Next. Um, which was his uh, famous BBS paper where he kind of reintroduced uh, the, the predictive processing framework um, mm. and, uh, you know, active inference along with the free energy principle. Um, so uh, that essentially uh, combined everything that I had ever found interesting in some sense. <laughs> and I had a real kind of conversion experience, if you want to call it that. Um, and so, uh, yeah, I, uh, I had the pleasure and privilege of meeting Carl in the flesh in May 2016 um, at a decision-making conference in Montreal. And, uh, you know, you, you've spoken to Carl a few times. He was uh, right. very typical of Carl. He was very, extremely generous with his time and friendly and insightful. Um, and uh, at the time I was working on sociocultural dynamics and I was wondering whether it was apt to apply the free energy principle to explain this kind of, you know, ensemble dynamics. And, uh, you know, Carl uh, responded uh, with an affirmative answer mm -hmm. uh, and encouraged me to, uh, you know, take this seriously and, and exchange with a few other people. Um, and what began was a very extensive email correspondence that turned into some papers. Uh, Carl then became my PhD supervisor uh, and I, I spent about yeah, the better part of two years in London uh, with his group at UCL, uh, learning the ins and outs of the free energy principle. Um, yeah, and so um, so I, I guess uh, that's that's sort of my story and how I met Carl. Uh, that's interesting, you know, and the the free energy principle. So um, 
you learned about it much earlier than than I did. I wish I'd have known about it earlier, but I didn't come across it until I guess a couple of years ago. Whenever mm-hmm. the first, you know, the first MLST episodes that that we did on it, but I had I had quite a bit of Bayesian, you know, background mm-hmm. um, up until that point. So when I first saw it, I thought, wow, this is it's really ingenious. You know, I like I'm, I'm fascinated by it, and we wanted to learn more. And so we've had we've had Professor Friston on the show a couple of times, and, mm-hmm. and like you said tremendously insightful mm. uh you know one of the most brilliant people i've ever spoken to it's such a joy um, to talk to him and i think even though we he's been on the show a few times and talked about it, we should probably frame up a little bit about what the free energy principle is you know, absolutely it'll, it'll play a big role in our communication going forward here so let me take a stab at it absolutely and then, that, and that's great you're the expert like i like <laughs> well you're usually really bit, good at summarizing <laughs> <laughs> well you know, what fascinates me about it, I think, is, and I want to get to the, the crux of this this beautiful statement that was made about it being the ultimate existential question, right? Because usually we think, um, what does what does a life form or a thing, even for that matter, what does it have to do to survive, right? Like this is kind of the, the emphasis of, you know, are you fit in the Darwinian sense? You know, what kind of fitness does it take to survive? But this, the free energy principle completely inverts that. And it says, Okay, if things exist, if things survive, what must they do, right? And it, exactly. and it turns it on the head in this way, which is let's assume that there is a thing, you know, and it, and it continues to survive, it continues to exist. Just by knowing that, what must it do? You know, what, what dynamics, what behavior must it have? Is that a fair framing? And, and what, is, what are those behaviors that things that exist must do? Um, so, uh, yeah, no, I think, uh, the way that you, uh, describe things is, uh, accurate and uh, an insightful way of putting things. Uh, the free energy principle, uh, d- is not just a, um, basically a theory, uh, according to which, uh, things that exist, uh, must be doing this or that, uh, as in it's not, it's not trying to, um, to tell you, uh, here's something that things do. In order to exist, what it's what it's telling you is we we observe that things exist in the sense that uh, there are uh, there are um, systems or uh, particles or things uh, that can be reliably re-identified that are uh, separated from but coupled to their environment. And given that we observe these things that exist, uh, what must be true of them? So it's a kind of inversion of the explanation, mm-hmm. moving to like a kind of a first principles account of what 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 must necessarily be the case uh, if you exist. And essentially, what the free energy principle tells you is that if you exist, in the sense that you are uh, separate from but coupled to an embedding environment, then it will look as if you're tracking the statistical structure of your environment, or more precisely, it'll look as if the states or paths that are internal to uh, a given, to your boundary of a given thing, track things that are external to that boundary. Um, so in some sense, it it explains why, um, or it provides a, a, a principle allowing us to uh, yeah, explain why uh, it, it looks as if everything that exists is, uh, yeah, tracking or representing, depending on how you want to think about right. it, uh, features that are external to it um and it, this this tracking or representing relation is um it is rather weak in some sense but we're not talking about like necessarily contentful representations little images in my head what we're talking about is uh something i think more fundamental or existential so for example um i can see from uh your your camera uh feed that you're wearing a uh a button shirt uh, that tells me something about your environment. Uh, so I, I can read mm-hmm. off you from the fact that you know you're wearing a button shirt that you're probably not in the Arctic somewhere. I mean, I can see your background also that that's kind of cheating. Uh, the basically we um, we can read off anything uh, properties of its in, of its embedding environment by virtue of the fact that it exists. Right. Right. So yeah, and there, I think there's an interesting point in there, which is that. It isn't this exact one-to-one correspondence, and I mean, really, how could it be, right? Like, how could a, how could say a subset of the system precisely represent 
the entire system, but instead, it, in a sense, it's representing an abstraction Absolutely. of that system. You know, and, and and I mean, I think there are even good energetic arguments why that would be the case because you know, you since you can't maintain total information, you maintain an abstraction of it, you maintain enough in order that you can predict and track, you know, behaviors because you exist, you must continue to exist, but you don't require complete information or mm. sufficient, sufficient tracking. Is Absolutely. That yeah. Heuristically, you can think of the, the free energy principle, and this is metaphorical, of course, but as a, a, a map of that part of the territory that behaves like a map. So, uh, it is, uh, a scientific, uh, principle that we can use to construct models of systems that appear as if they are in turn modeling or tracking mm. aspects of their environment. Um, and I think thinking about modeling for a second is useful here. So if you had a one, one scale map, uh, is it Borges who, who, uh, presents that in a, in a story at some point? Uh, yeah, I think so. Yeah. So a one to one scale map would be completely useless, right? Uh, I mean, just imagine the quantity right. of paper that you would need to, <laughs> have a map of say LA right a one to one scale map of LA it wouldn't be useful in the generation of uh, you know your actions uh, so the map is necessarily simpler than the territory um, but that's okay in some sense right because the implication of that is that using the map you're going to encounter errors you're going to generate errors but uh, in the active inference and the free energy principle approach those errors are the relevant signal basically so all, right. all you have to do is have a good enough map and act in such a way that you are informed by what your map contains in terms of information um, and to in real time course correct based on the errors that you're generating. Um, so right. it's the, these errors and the kind of oversimplified character of the model are uh, features rather than bugs. Uh, you, you would need that to, in order to have a signal at all in some sense. Yeah, and there and there there is this iterative nature to it that I mm. think is is sometimes forgotten because uh, you know there are these two components in the free energy principle. Um, one is fidelity. How mm. accurately does it kind of map to uh, the environment? Like so so if you if you think of the, the the entity that's surviving, the thing that's surviving, you know, it has to have a model of the environment. Mm. Has to be have some degree of fidelity because if it doesn't, it's not accurate enough to maintain its survival. But at the same time, it also has to have adaptability, mm -hmm. right? Because the information is never complete. There's always new, uh, you know, phenomenon occurring to it. The, the environment is changing or whatever. So the model has to maintain a degree of flexibility, right? And that's what this, this kind of entropy term in there mm -hmm. is. It's saying, Precisely. Look, um, you know, you need to maintain a certain amount of entropy because that is a form of flexibility. Is that correct? I mean, that's absolutely correct. And you can think of the entropy in a a few different ways. Um, and it, the, the entropy term, uh, in, in previous discussions with uh, Carl Friston, you have highlighted the, its technical importance. Um, I mean, basically what we are, uh, what we're trying to do when we minimize free energy uh, is to uh, increase the predictive accuracy uh, of our model. Uh, so that is uh, to have a model that uh, generates predictions that are as close as possible to the real data that I'm ingesting. Um, but the free energy principle uh, allows us to, in a, in a principle manner, um, penalize the complexity of the model, right? Because you, you don't just want an arbitrary explanation. As you know, you, you can construct an arbitrary uh explanation sure. uh, for, for any uh, data set and uh, you know it, well, if it can you even give... be deleterious if it's Absolutely. If, you have inco if you have incomplete information mm. and you model it too accurately accurately in a loose sense then actually you're, you're just you're, you're memorizing uh, spurious information that doesn't generalize. Right? Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. And so um, the free energy principle uh, when you're when you're applying it and you're saying that uh, systems that exist, minimize this this quantity variational free energy uh the the variational free energy can be decomposed uh roughly speaking into predictive accuracy minus complexity and so what you're doing is you're you're penalizing your gains in predictive accuracy against uh the the, the complexity cost of your model basically penalizing every new degree of freedom that you need to introduce into your model to explain the data so in some sense, uh, the free energy principle uh, is sort of like, um, you can think of it 
as a kind of like a statistical predictive accuracy, uh, but also Occam's razor. Right, right, right. So yeah, the well, it, no, no, it, it makes sense. I mean, and the, and that's it's this interesting balance, and the mm. free energy principle encodes that balance. And I guess the simplest, the simplest way possible. This this is a sense in which the free ener, free energy principle applies to itself because it's that's right. It's almost the simplest <laughs> formulation of that of that balance, right? Yeah, and, yeah I mean, um, there are all sorts of ways to control for complexity that have been introduced in machine learning. Uh, but uh, those all uh, might seem ad hoc in some sense. What we try to do is to build in this complexity control uh, right into the objective function that, that we're using, right? So it's it's at the core of the architecture is that rather than just use reward, uh, which you could probably cast in terms of like predictive accuracy, so I think we, we have one more foundational concept that I'd like to kind of get on the table, and that is just the concept of a thing, mm. you know, because a, because a thing, the idea of a thing is is defined in a very certain way in the context of the, the free energy principle. And it's all about this this Markov blanket. And mm. and we've, we've talked about Markov blankets a few times on the show. They tend to be confusing. You know, I, I, I tend to, I, I almost visualize them usually as uh, cells, like in, in the mm. human body. So like, you know, you, you have a cell and it has stuff inside and then it has the cell membrane and then there's the stuff outside, which is kind of the environment. And that membrane, in a sense, is the Markov blanket. Mm -hmm. It's the set of stuff and states between, you know, what's inside and outside. Mm -hmm. But can you talk a bit about, you know, why Markov blankets are important, what they are, you know, how they're defined um, and Absolutely. maybe some of the edge cases, like does an eternal flame have a Markov blanket? Why or why not? That's those. That's a great set of questions. Um, so uh, you can think of the free energy principle as um, a the same kind of thing as the principle of least action, uh, in the sense that it's it's a principle that allows you to write down uh, mechanical theories or mechanics, right? Uh, so uh, classical mechanics has the principle of least action, um, and the principle of least action is basically a way of uh, specifying the, uh, the the conservation laws that we want to see our systems conform to, in particular, the the, the balance of the potential and kinetic energies uh, right. are zero, and uh, the real trajectory of systems, physical systems, are those for which that balance uh, holds, and uh, they they are. And maybe I'll out. just quickly interject here. It's not so much that we want them to conform to that; it's just that they do. <laughs> yeah, like, and, and that and that's actually key to the free energy principle too, because it's it's not like it's not like we want things to obey the free energy principle. It's that they must obey the free energy mm. principle if, if they, you know, exist. Right. Yeah, absolutely. So, I was speaking in, in the manner of a mathematician. Oh yeah, uh, no, totally, totally get it. I just wanted to point this out uh, to our readers is that, cause as we go along, like you are almost, these are principles that in the case of classical mechanics just are, they're just the way things behave. Right. And in the case of the free energy principle, if you survive, if you exist, you're inexorably drawn mm. to this set of dynamics, mm. to this set of mechanics. Mm. Otherwise, you don't exist. Well, to get technical for a second, I think there are two issues uh, that, that are both striking uh, and that speak to what you just said. So uh, things like the principle of least action and the free energy principle and the principle of maximum entropy they are, uh, in some sense, true a priori or mathematically. They are mathematical truths. So you wouldn't try to falsify the principle of least action empirically mm -hmm. any more than you would, say, uh, try to falsify calculus or probability theory by coming up with an empirical counterexample. So there's a sense in which like the, the truth of these statements is robust and mathematical. Um, having said that, it is a striking empirical fact that the physical universe does in fact seem to conform right. to these mathematical regularities. So it's sort of a one-two punch uh, in some sense. And um, Right, right. It's the unreasonable effectiveness of, of mathematics. Absolutely, yeah. Uh, and, and it's getting even more unreasonable now with the free energy principle coming into play. Um, so the, the way I like to think about the free energy principle is, uh, like I was saying, as introducing a new family of mechanical theories or mechanics. So uh, you have uh, classical mechanics, uh, which follows from the principle of least action. 
um, and you have quantum mechanics and you have statistical mechanics. Um, so basically the idea behind the free energy principle is let's get the rest of physics working in the background. So you get you get your classical statistical okay. and quantum mechanics working with all of those. Uh, yeah, all of that mechanics is in play. And then you ask a simple question, what does it mean to be a thing in this context? I.e., what could it possibly mean to uh, re-identify some state as the system as being the same state over time? Um, and so, yeah, unpacking that question leads to a Bayesian mechanics. Uh, so Bayesian mechanics is a physics, uh, but it's a it's a physics for the that that kind of dually constrains uh, the system itself, the physical system, and the beliefs that the system encodes about the things to which it's coupled. Right. And that okay. I think is really the key uh, for uh, that kind of underwrites this whole construction. Uh, this is also what makes it unique among other uh, you know candidates in the cognitive sciences and, and the biosciences. Uh, it's that it, it is connecting the thermodynamic entropy of the states that the system is made of to the right. information entropy of the beliefs, the probabilistic beliefs that those states encode. So the free energy principle is all about this hinge between the two. And the equations of motion that you write down using the free energy principle are constrained in both of these spaces. And that, I think, is absolutely the key to understanding what's going on here. Like... The, yeah. the, the the system trajectories that you get uh, when you're writing uh, when you're writing down an FEP theoretic uh, model uh, of the system that you're considering it is constrained both by the the physics and thermodynamics of the system and by the physics of the representations if you will uh, that the, the system is entertaining about the rest of the universe in some sense um, and I think and it's it's not without precedence in the sense that, for example, in statistical mechanics, you know, back back when we're deriving Boltzmann's distribution, and there were questions about, are these particles, do they behave as if they're identical, or if mm -hmm. they have the same attributes, are they are they are they the same particle? And the same thing with um, Pauli exclusion, you know, it applies mm -hmm. to some particles and not others. So there, those are examples of where a statistical um, calculation, a statistical property does map to the actual f underlying physics, mm -hmm. you know, that, that's happening as well. This is almost a, a big step up from that. It's like, it, it, you know, it's a, it's a generalization um, to a much richer set of, um, I don't want to say conservation laws, but a much richer set of these uh, fl flow laws, you know. Absolutely. And, and, and dynamics, that's yeah. That's exactly the right way to think about it. Um, in fact, it, what's transpired over the last few years is that, Really, you can think of the free energy principle as a kind of generalization of the second law of thermodynamics to open systems. Um, so, you know, the, the kind right. of universality uh, that the second law uh, has with respect to closed systems, uh, the free energy principle has with respect to uh, systems that are far from equilibrium. And as Carl has, uh, you know, pointed out, the Markov blanket is precisely the apparatus that allows you to move from the equilibrium to the non-equilibrium regime in right. the sense that you right. are now specifying the interface through which the system is coupling to its environment or the particle. So the word system is a bit ambiguous. Usually, um, you know, because we could mean, you know, the whole in agent environment system, sure. or we could mean uh, the specific kind of compartments that, that we're considering as agents. Uh, yeah. So the, uh, you can think of the, the free energy principle as applying to um, systems that are not at equilibrium and as giving you the dynamics of like particles within the overall system. Uh, if there exist particles in the system, if there are these things that you can poke and re-identify uh, over time, right. then the free energy principle will basically tell you how they behave on average. Yeah, and it's it's interesting because almost the Markov blanket really provides a concept of stability. Because mm -hmm. when I think about equilibrium, right? When, when um, you know, the thermodynamic kind of equilibrium, what comes to mind, at least visually to me, is things that are kind of unchanging and, and just kind of quiescent and they're just sitting there like a goo, 
you know, that's kind of all thermally stabilized and never, never moving around. But that's the point. The key point there is stability. Like mm-hmm. it's, a, it's a stable sort of unchanging system. And what the Markov blanket gives you is a way of defining a property that's stable about mm-hmm. the system. And yet the system as a whole may be far from stable. It may right. be in flux and moving around all the time and jiggling. It's the eternal flame where the boundary is, you know, kind of changing all the time. But there's this property that you can map from from time to time that that's still there. And so it's mm-hmm. the stable, um, the stable blanket, even though it may have a different form, it's still got a boundary between some stuff that's inside and outside that's identifiable, you know, from frame to frame, if you will. Yeah, and I I I I'd go even further and say that it's the self-identical pattern that you see at all scales of self-organization. Uh, so it's got this kind of fractal quality to it where, uh, you know, the it's blankets of blankets of blankets of blankets. Uh, so, right. I mean, you can think of the brain, for example. Uh, so the brain has this nice Markov blanketed uh, structure uh, at several different scales. So you can start with neurons um, and neurons have their own uh, Markov blankets. That, yeah, they and, cell membrane. <laughs> yeah, precisely, uh, and it's probably the most obvious. But you can go downwards in scales and upwards in scales, and what you recover uh, are uh, you know similarly Markov blanketed structures. Uh, you know from uh, the sure. uh, the from the voltage gated channels uh, on a cell membrane to dendrites uh, to the uh, you know arborescences that, that form up to the 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 uh, the neurons uh, soma, uh, and then you know uh, you could go the other direction too, right? From uh, neurons to canonical microcircuits uh, to uh, more specialized brain regions to right. brain networks, and so on. All of these things are things uh, they can be reliably re-identified with their own kind of uh, you know, uh, properties and features and connectivity to other things. Um, and they all have this same pattern uh, that repeats, uh, and, and so it, okay, it really so, is. Yeah. So, and and I think anybody can see that pattern. You know, I mean, look around. We got mm. we have trees, and they have boundaries, and you know, yeah, even higher in scale, you have planets and, and galaxies. And but at the same time, if you if you dig down into it and you try to really precisely define it, then it it slips away. It's like if I zoom into the surface of my skin, you know. Mm fine enough well it's no longer a surface it's this ragged thing with cell membranes and then (laughs) the cell membranes are molecules with tons of space you know in between them and heck atoms you know are are mostly empty right like there's this this weird you know vagueness and difficulty in defining Mm -hmm. you know boundaries so they're not sharp like how's the concept of of a markov blanket how does it evolve to that kind of fuzziness or or this this great set of questions your questions are so on point Keith, frankly, uh, this is uh, so. Um, I would say the the first thing to say is that so this is sort of mind physics or brain physics, if you want to think about it like that. And um, okay. one hallmark of explanation in physics is simplification, or uh, you know, you might say oversimplification. Um, <laughs> so I, I'm sure um, a biologist reading a paper on the free energy principle might look at this and go, but you know, this is way too oversimplified. Where is the biological detail? Um, I think physicists also do this to physical phenomena, right? Like that's that's sort of the joke. A physicist would respond, yeah, but we do that to physics as well, right? Like it's, uh, so yeah, th- there is a deliberate I- idealization going on. Uh, if you define this Markov blanket strictly as the, the set of degrees of freedom that render some in- inside a- independent of the outside, Right. So if conditioned on the blanket states, you can speak of statistical independence between the inside and the outside. Well, uh, that that is too strict to describe most physical systems. Right. Uh, so I, right. I assume uh, you, myself and our listeners, we all had a bit of coffee this morning. We've all used the washroom. Uh, so there's clearly a, a kind of permeability. Exactly. There, there's clearly a kind of permeability at play. Uh, and so, uh, yeah, we, we know that there is material turnover in most of the kinds of systems that we find interesting, especially those that self-organize far from equilibrium. So sure. the Markov blanket is necessarily um, an idealization. Um, having said that, um, there are good reasons to think, and we have some results coming out 
later this year. Uh, a lot of them are due to our senior mathematician, Dalton Shakti Vadivel, who is an absolute dynamo. Um, so uh, we, yeah, I've seen, I've seen some of his papers. Yeah. It's, it's very impressive stuff. He, he's been working on um, weak or fuzzy blankets uh, okay. in precisely this context. So the, the idea is, uh, can we uh, get really rigorous about the uh, mathematics of approximate Markov blankets or fuzzy right. Markov blankets? Um, and the idea in a lot of his work is to construct this, this quantity called the blanket index uh, to gloss over some of the technical details just for in the interest of a... Our uh, our audience uh, basically uh, there. In, if you consider a given dynamical system, there exists a Markov blanket in that system if a specific inner product is equal to zero. Uh, so, in particular, this is the the Hessian of the and the, uh, the solenoidal flow, the the product of those two things being zero. What well, it, it basically is a way of um, quantifying the the force or the curvature. Uh, that a system is subject to, uh, and uh, yeah, if if the entries uh, in this inner product are zero, then there is a strict Markov blanket. But there's a way of constructing um, an index or a measure such that you can accumulate the non-zero entries um, and basically quantify how far from perfect blanketedness a system finds itself. Um, right. And so, uh, yeah, this blanket index has a number of interesting properties. Um, one of which is that it 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 uh, tends to zero as systems increase in size. Hmm. So Un under uh, what kind of assumption? So it tends. To um, it, it's very 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 general. Uh, so like I, a locality assumption or, or well, something yeah, like. Yeah, you get the locality stuff. From from the background, right? So you get the rest of mechanics going, right? So oh, okay, okay. So then uh, you already have like you know relativity in the background, and you have uh, statistical uh, okay. mechanics, classical yeah. mechanics, and all that stuff. So yeah, uh, you do get uh, this kind of nice uh, locality. So, so that's interesting. So in in a universe like ours that has the the basic physics that that a universe like ours has, as the scale of a system gets larger and larger. You, you generate Markov blankets. You're almost, bound almost to, surely. with a probability huh. one. Yeah, absolutely. Fascinating. Uh, and you know, most of the systems that we consider in physics are large in the appropriate sense, right? Uh, so yeah, think yeah. about how many molecules are in a, in a drop of water, right? It's 10 to the 26, right? It, Just, it's I... some, some, something times Avogadro's number, yeah, which exactly. by itself is 10 to the 23rd, yeah. Massive. Yeah, to 10 to the 23, sorry. Yeah, so that's just for a single drop of water. Now, if you consider the brain, the brain has like something on the order of 100, uh, 150 billion neurons, uh, each of which make thousands of connections. If each of those connections can encode a parameter, then you're talking about like a very large system, right? We're, we're way, way, way beyond like, you know, 20, 50, 1,000 different states that, that, that are coupled together. We're talking about like, billions and trillions yep. of different states. So there's reason to think that just due to the physics of the situation, uh, most relevant things that we might want to consider will have Markov blankets. Um, and uh, I mean, it, 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 so Dalton is going to be releasing a few papers having to do with large fluctuation theorems. Okay, th and th so this, th this, let's pause for a minute and appreciate this, because this to me is a fascinating, <laughs> a fascinating result. So... <laughs> Okay, so we start from the point of a Markov blanket is kind of this intuitive concept, right? Like it's, you know, a boundary and, and that sort of thing, but there's no reason to believe that they're inevitable. And I'm finding it fascinating that there's, that there's this work, right? That says that as a scale, so we have a measure of blanketness. It's kind of between zero and one. Zero That's has right. a, a blanket, one doesn't, okay? That's right. and, and yet as the scale of the system gets larger and larger, blanketness approaches you know zero you, you get blankets um, no matter what and in a sense there's a sense in which that's recapitulating what we see if we just look around like mm. everybody out there listening look around yourself and you're going to see blankets all over the place you're going to see things and those things have have boundaries right but it's it's remarkable right that that there's a mathematical proof that that's inevitable um, in this sense isn't it? Well, I, I think it's remarkable in part because we have approached uh, the question of self-organization and emergence 
from a, yeah. a false starting point. Uh, so I, I've been going around saying recently Aristotle was wrong. Uh, that's that's sort of my philosophical start. Point. Well, the whole is much less than the sum of its parts, it turns out. Um, so, uh, yeah, th there, there are a bunch of things to unpack from that. Well, the first is that um, what makes you the kind of thing that you are is the sparsity of your coupling to the rest of the world, right? If you think of a gas, right, uh, where everything yeah. is coupled to everything else, then it's just this fuzz and it's all one system and there's there's no you can't really identify particles within the system uh particles or things are defined by their sparse connections to everything else so i am in some sense what i am not uh, or i can be defined in terms of what i'm not connected to as opposed to what i am connected to i mean if you were to create like a giant adjacency matrix for the entire universe most of it would be empty right no, I get that, what you're that's saying. That's critical. Now, the, the whole the whole is less than the sum of the parts, which is but there's more. If you if you get rid of the parts, you have you have less. Right, <laughs> and but but there's more. Um, the uh, so think of an engine, right? Like the, an engine functions as an organized whole uh, because you're constraining its parts to behave in very specific ways. So like you know, right. if you think of an engine more specifically, like a, a petrol engine. Um, well, the, the mechanical effect of the engine you get by, you know, moving these pistons in a specific, you know, direction up and down. And the best way to wreck your engine is to introduce new degrees of freedom into it, right? I would not want to introduce new degrees of freedom into the pistons. It's a, that's right. a great way to just tear your engine apart. And I would uh, submit to you that this is, uh, you know, a, an, an accurate way of thinking about all self-organization. We exist as wholes because our parts are constrained to behave in very specific ways. So it's not merely that I am what I am because I, I am not what I am not, which is a nice tautology. Uh, it's that the, what makes me what I am is the way that I remove degrees of freedom from my parts such that they conspire to create, you know, to generate me as an overall pattern. Uh, so, I mean, it's, it's counterintuitive from the perspective that we inherited from, you know, a, a traditional Aristotelian metaphysics, but, um, I mean, uh, yeah, it, so, it, it isn't, it's, it's, it's so exciting. I mean, honestly, I, it like, really I, is. I don't know, I don't know why I get excited, but to me, it's, it's, it's really excited. And this, I mean, so this is work that's coming out of verses, correct? That's right. Yeah, that's right. And so oh, um, we should, coming we, out of, yeah. I would say uh, coming out of uh, Carl Friston's group more generally, and let's not forget, you know, Carl uh, proposed the free energy principle in the middle of the 2000 knots. Yep. Um, and so, yeah, uh, but definitely this is uh, the, the the powerhouse behind uh, versus AI technologies. Uh, so, yeah, and let's yeah. talk about that for a minute because um, yeah. we generally don't talk about, you know, companies on the show, but this... To me, this is an exception because it's it's fascinating what you guys are doing. Thank you. And um, so, versus versus technology is trying to operationalize this understanding, really, and this is uh, correct. As, as technology. And I guess, and I I'm super excited by what we've been talking about conceptually. But tell me, why should anybody care? Like, what does this what does this fascinating you know, view of philosophy and, and mathematics and the relationship to really, I, I think it's really about understanding complex systems in a, mm. in a new way and new mechanics of complex systems. What does that mean for us? What does it mean technologically? Well, uh, thank you for your excellent question. Um, so I, I think what, one of the things that we want to do at Versus is to uh, apply active inference to artificial intelligence. So active okay. inference is basically the kind of machine learning that follows from adopting the free energy principle as your kind of core method. Our contention at Versus is that active inference will be to the 2020s what reinforcement learning was to the 2010s effectively. So uh, okay. it's going to be, we think, the way of doing uh, machine learning, uh, the ethical, scalable, if most efficient way of doing machine learning. Um, and there are a lot of different um, aspects to that. Um, so uh, one of the main differences between uh, artificial intelligence built on the principles of active inference and more traditional approaches is that we start uh, 
from an explicit generative model, so-called. Um, okay. So we talked about the Markov blanket. Uh, the generative model is another core piece of the free energy principle uh, puzzle or uh, constellation, if you will. And the, the generative model is basically um, our, a statistical description of the dependency relations within the system that you're considering. Um, so when we're talking about Markov blankets, actually what we're saying is the generative model of the system contains a Markov blanket, right? So uh, all of these dependency relations that we're writing down, uh, like once you do write them down, you, you get this nice sparseness structure where some parts of the system do not affect other parts of the system. Um, and so, yeah, uh, this this generative model um, is, is really key to the doing of the free energy principle. Um, and so, uh, yeah, what we do in active inference is write down generative models, explicitly okay. labeled generative models that then uh, allow us to, uh, you know, perform inference. Uh, they allow us to do that because the uh, variational free energy that we were discussing earlier, um, basically the the uh, the gradients of the free energy that you're following they come from this generative model basically. Uh, right. So uh, yeah, the the model itself is this explicitly labeled structure, and this is where you get like a huge explainability uh, advantage. We we actually have a paper that uh, came out uh, on designing artificial intelligence, e explainable artificial intelligence using uh, active inference, and uh, yeah, what what you get just immediately from flipping to an active inference framework is a way to write down uh, yeah, generative model such that it is explicitly labeled and thereby auditable uh, by human users and stakeholders. Uh, so you don't have this unlabeled you know, 10 trillion <laughs> parameter net, as it were. Uh, right, right. What, what you have instead is uh, yeah, a, a model that explicitly represents all of the different factors in the situation that you want to control. So let me and, dig into this. Let me dig into this a yeah. little bit. Um, so, and I, because I'm curious, there's a connection here to some some work I used to do a long time ago. So, mm. writing down generative models, my experience has been at least is uh, it's it's actually relatively easy to do that. So, for example, a long time ago, um, I was contracted to do some work on mad cow disease, mm. so we could try and figure out um, what interventions to do to reduce right? The spread of mad cow disease. Mm -hmm. And it was pretty, pretty easy to uh, learn about the, uh, the food system, the supply chain, the food system to model, you know, the processing of, um, of cattle and, and that sort of thing and write down a large simulator. Mm -hmm. So this would be a generative model it can sit there and can generate trajectories through this space, right? Like we knew we could do that. We couldn't tell you anything about the large scale kind of thermodynamics of the mm. system or, or anything, right? We could write down this generative model though, and then using, um, you know, various sampling and techniques like that, we could then um, uh, compute statistics from it, mm. try out interventions, see which of those had, had kind of a beneficial effect. But that was all ad hoc, you know, architecture that we, we designed and, and produced by ourselves. If I'm understanding you correctly, um, what you're doing is producing a technology that one um, formalizes that much more and applies the free energy principle, I think, to help guide like the sampling and the optimization and, you know, really just the effective use of these kind of generative, you know, simulations and models. Um, is that close to what you're talking about? That's right. Um, so, I mean, you can, why use active inference? It is demonstrably the most efficient machine learning technique. So it's sort of like a, you know a Carnot cycle analysis, but for for an engine, but for AI. Uh, in particular, uh, what the free energy principle uh, allows us to formalize uh, is the thermodynamics of uh, information writing onto the boundary. Um, so uh, in in some of the newer work uh, on the quantum information theoretic formulation of the free energy principle. Uh, which we don't necessarily have to get into in detail, but uh, th there are these kind of new uh, scale-free extensions to the free energy principle that have been developed uh, oh, okay. that appeal to uh, the tools that have been developed, not in quantum mechanics, right? So the theory of very small, fast things, but quantum information theory 
Uh, so the kind of information theory that gets augmented to handle things like probability amplitudes, which are the uh, the roots of probability densities, and so you can get your wave equations moving in place and all that. So the uh, that formulation of the free energy principle allows us to formulate uh, the computations carried out by a system in terms of like a per bid read and write cost. So okay. there's a there's a there's a sense in which like you're you're bringing it down to the like to the 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 bare kind of you know m machine elements of the of your computations and you're you're writing things down in a way that is demonstrably the most efficient way of doing it. So if you if you set up you know some simulation system using active inference you are uh and this kind of brings the conversation full circle in some sense you are generating a model that is as predictively accurate as possible but also that expends as little energy as possible due to this you know controlling for the uh complexity of the model so there yeah we we have this um this preprint uh up uh, that we'll be revising soon uh, called the map territory fallacy fallacy, which is precisely about the kind of uh, canonical nature of uh, FEP theoretic modeling. Uh, yeah, the, uh, you know, the one of the reasons why the FEP is optimal um, is that it's it's another way of writing down Jane's maximum entropy principle. So for our uh, audience, uh, the maximum entropy principle uh, you can think about it from, from the point of view of statistics and also from the point of view of statistical mechanics. From the point of view of statistical ma mechanics, the maximum entropy principle is the principle according to which things dissipate. Um, so uh, from, from the point of view of statistics, it's the principle according to which give me a data set uh, and a set of models from which I might have sampled that data set. The, it says the model with the highest entropy is most likely to be the uh, the real model from which you sampled. Uh, so uh, right. that's a way like of kind of saying like, what is a maximum entropy probability density? It's a flat density, right? And so uh, basically, a uh, maximum entropy probability density encodes no information because all of the outcomes are equally probable. And in some sense, what Occam's razor would tell you is that like you would want your model to be as flat as possible, right? You want to build right. in as spread as, out as possible. Exactly. You want to build in as few uh, assumptions as possible into your model. This brings it back to the whole keeping your options open thing that you were saying uh, you were discussing earlier. Uh, you know, if you're thinking of a probability density over different courses of action. Uh, unless you're really sure that you want to do this, you probably want to keep things uh, as non-committal as possible and keep your options open. Um, so, the just to back up, then the free energy principle is a is a way of writing down uh, the principle of maximum entropy. They are effectively the same thing. Uh, you, you can move from the one to the other, and um, we know that the principle of maximum entropy is 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 the principle of parsimonious explanation in some sense right so if the fep and maximum entropy are the same principle then all of the epistemic virtues that accrue to maximum entropy also carry over to the fep and therefore uh yeah a a a free energy principle theoretic model of the belief updating of a particle can be shown to be the optimal dynamic systems model for the whole system that you're considering. Like there, there is a kind of canonicity, uh, what we're calling Jane's optimality. That yeah, the basically the FEP it allows you to write down the best model that you could for your the system that you're considering given your current state of knowledge in that system. It's just the optimal way of writing that down. Full stop. Uh, so that's why we, you know, care yeah, about active it, inference. It, yeah, it might be useful to to give, you know, some examples mm. of um of, you know, maximum entropy distributions to understand. So for example, uh, if you have a data set um and, and let's just suppose it's continuous, you know, data and it's and it's positive only. So I know that it's continuous data, it's positive only, and I know that it has a particular mean. You know, um then the, the distribution that has the maximum entropy under those examples is an exponential distribution, mm -hmm. right? Like it's, it's sort of spread out as much as possible 
um, and yet it has a particular particular mean. Mm. And 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 for example, if we go to the case of it can be a real number anywhere between minus infinity and infinity, and it has a mean, but it also has a finite variance, mm. then you wind up with the Gaussian, you know, distribution mm. as being, you know, the maximum. So it's really, it's it's a distribution that captures what you know about the system, i.e. the constraints, right? And yet is as spread out as it's possible to be while satisfying those constraints, right? Yeah, absolutely. And, and you know, uh, I hope our audience is able to kind of see the pattern that's starting to form here, you know, uh, like all of these connections are non-accidental, right? So the, the FEP is all about balancing your predictive accuracy and your complexity. So all these things are kind of connected at a deep level. Uh, and yeah, I mean, maybe the audience also can see why we're so excited about this. <laughs> like this is highly well, non-trivial. <laughs> well, no, and, and, and I don't know if this is crazy or not, but it, it actually even seems to have implications for... Uh, fairness of a, of models because mm. so for example um suppose i'm trying to train a model that d does anything of, of human interest you know mm. diagnose uh or prescribe medical treatments or you know give out give out loans or, or that sort of thing and, and we need to train it on some type of, of data whether it's a generative model that we calculate or um, data that we actually observe well we want we want the system we want the machine to learn only what's relevant for that particular task and like nothing else. You know, we don't right. want it to, to learn kind of extraneous things. So for example, if it's deciding to hand out medical diagnoses, we want it to be based solely upon the uh, medical attributes that are in, in the, you know, the data set mm -hmm. and not some spurious, you know, correlation to like a, the geography or, you know, mm -hmm. where, where you came from or, or um, the letters in your name you know, of, of your file or anything like that. And so in a sense, um, what maximum entropy helps you to do is force out that stuff because that right. stuff, if it's not useful for the actual prediction, it'll get, you know, ironed out because it'll That's get right. smoothed out by the demand of maximum entropy. That's right. And, and that brings us back to sparseness, right? How so? Tell me. Well, in the sense that, um, you know, this, this even has to do with like situation or task definition, uh, like situations are sparse. Uh, they're not all, not everything is connected to everything. Not everything is relevant okay, to yeah, everything yeah. else. Sure. Uh, so th there's even like a kind of, it, it's really a kind of a meta uh, methodology because you, you can even define specific situations in terms of their sparseness. And then, you know, the, yeah. The, so, it, um, so it, sound, it sounds great, but I'm always the eternal skeptic because I know a lot of this type of computation, you know, the, the generative, starting with a generative model, doing inference on it, just computationally is so difficult. Like what, mm. what is the magic that Versus has found and, and how are you so sure that, uh, how are you so confident it's going to work? Great question. Um, so, I mean, in particular, one of the big questions that uh, plagues generative model-based methods is where do your priors come from, right? So, what is the structure of your model? Why, what are the parameters that you're using? What's the relevant state space? All of that uh, is often, I mean, you, often you have to hand design this stuff and it's very labor intensive. Um, so, at Versus, we are a, uh, a contextual computing company. Um, so we draw inspiration from the architecture of the brain, uh, and uh, basically we're proposing a kind of general uh, standards-based solution to the problem of where do your models, where do your priors come from. Um, so just to uh, you know, do a crash course in neuroscience. Um, so well, we, uh, we love neuroscience here. So please, uh, I'm, please do. I'm sure. Well, so great source uh, of inspiration. I'm sure everyone is familiar with the idea that the brain has a layered or hierarchical structure. Um, so it's not the case that the brain is just a soup of connections where everything connects to everything else. Um, no, to the contrary, there, is, there are very regular structured patterns of connectivity uh, in the brain. Um, okay. Again, this takes us back to the theme of sparseness, right? Uh, like the uh, to, to say that the brain has a hierarchical organization is to say that it evinces a specific, very special kind of sparseness where connections uh, are 
directed in specific ways where you're, you're connected to layers immediately above and below you, but nothing beyond that. Um, so, so we've, we've spoken in the past to, to Jeff Hawkins, like, is this related at all to the concepts of cortical columns and like the way in which they're connected? Like it almost has these, you know, components that are reused and, and put together. Absolutely. In, in terms of different layers. Uh, yeah. Uh, the, and not all the layers speak to each other. Um, from a, uh, an active inference perspective, this layered or uh, level, uh, level involving structure has a specific purpose. Um, so what each level is doing is providing priors uh, or uh, expectations to the level below and receiving mm -hmm. context from the level above. And uh, what each layer is doing in turn is shuffling prediction errors to the to the uh, level above and receiving prediction er errors from the, the level uh, below. Um, so what, what you have is basically uh, a set of layers that contextualize each other. And the way that each layer contextualizes the next one is essentially coarse graining, right? So uh, there's some fast, uh, fast, small scale activity uh, that lower levels are tracking closer to the sensory end. And what each successive layer is doing is finding basically the the uh, set of hidden states or latent states uh, that explain variance in the data that it's receiving, and, and so on uh, in this kind of hierarchical fashion. Um, so the the brain is not one monolithic system; rather. Uh, each layer of the brain is specialized in encoding specific features of the situation pitched at a specific scale, and it functions by kind of providing context. So we like to say that the brain is an organ of context, effectively, where uh, really what it embodies is successive layers of context that are each coarse graining each other in this kind of uh, fashion. So, so I know, I, I know our neural network fans out there in the audience are going to, they're, they're going to be hearing that, that that's just what a neural network is. Like it has kind of layers, you know, they're connected. What's, what's different about just any other, you know, kind of neural network architecture, if you will. So what, what we're proposing is an infrastructure project in some sense. Uh, we have, uh, we're working with the uh, IEEE um, in the U S. Uh, so when I say we, we, um, versus that has a sister uh, organization, a nonprofit called the Spatial Web Foundation, which was uh, to whom we gifted uh, the, the first massive chunk of research that came out of our group. Um, and what we are developing with the Spatial Web Foundation is a, stat, is a set of public standards uh, that people can use to build out uh, basically oh, okay. shared knowledge graphs so we're building an ecosystem where uh, folks can basically uh, think of this as sort of like Wikidata or Wikipedia, but for kind of shared contextual compute context. Uh, so, you know, obviously uh, we are building this out. So we're going to be the first to put things onto this network. But what we're trying to build is basically a spatial web or a hyper spatial web that kind of in some sense reflects the structure, the kind of graph structure um, of uh, the, the various kinds of situations that humans uh, deal with. I got with. it. So it's so it's it's really an application of of <laughs> interesting. So it's an it's an application of the free energy principle at multiple scales. Absolutely. Not, okay. Okay. Yeah, so yeah. I, I, my mind was going in the wrong direction here, which is I was going to like the scale of of uh, you know the individual thing and 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 how it does its. It's modeling, it's compute, but this is this is more than that. This is well, it is, is really that a, you're absolutely it's, correct. It's that, to point but it's, that it's out. more than that. It's it's that, That's and right. it's and it's actually like a multi-scale, I guess, arbitrarily nested, really, uh, framework for communication across. Absolutely, not, absolutely. Not even a, it's it's more than a mesh. It's um, what's the right word for it? It's a hypergraph, I guess. Yeah, it's it's a, it's a hyperspace. A hyperspace. So we, okay. we we call this the you know the 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 name of the protocol that we've developed uh, for modeling is called the hyperspatial modeling language, HSML. It, it, it's, it's meant as a, an homage and a nod to uh, H, HTML. 
And uh, what we I hope have... it doesn't use the same syntax, please. <laughs> no, no, it won't. Um, well, uh, what we've also built is uh, a transaction protocol and a querying language that, that live within the hyperspace. So, so called uh, hyperspace transaction protocol, HSTP, and uh, the hyperspace, hyperspace querying clever. language, HSQL. Um, and so, yeah, what, what we are basically in the business of doing is, on the one hand, building out these graphical models uh, of knowledge, basically, of the knowledge that is involved in specific tasks, domains, and situations. Uh, and then we've developed methods to take these uh, knowledge graphs and to flip them into graphical models of inference. Uh, so that's okay. really that's that's kind of where the, the the secret sauce and the magic happens is that, that this is a two step process and the overall versus technology stack combines uh, active inference based AI with explicit generative models on the one hand and this kind of nested hyperspatial representation of the problems uh, to be solved on the other uh, and the the technologies uh, kind of are uh, married uh, through the, their kind of reliance on uh, on graphical techniques, basically. So it's it's knowledge graphs meets graphical inference in, in a nutshell. Um, yeah, oh. and um, we uh, we really are committed to developing these in terms of uh, you know open, publicly available standards. Uh, you know, th there's a lot of as I'm sure you're acutely aware. There's a lot of um, you know hype and doomerism <laughs> going on right now. Uh, with regards to AI, there's a lot of, uh, I think, maybe uh, over inflammatory, uh, you know, doomerism and over utopian hype going on. Um, and uh, in terms of, you know, the different options that we have to uh, develop these technologies in a responsible way, there, there seems to be one call for, you know, government oversight which is interesting, but comes with its lot of uh, limitations. For example, governments are limited to their jurisdictions. Uh, and so, you know, you can't, uh, you can't coordinate an international community of research and development in R&D merely through uh, national regulation. Uh, so that's limited. On, on the other hand, you have, you know, uh, markets uh, and uh, companies that want to, uh, you know, solve these issues in-house. Uh, they are maybe faster and more flexible, but th there is this necessity of, you know, uh, how do you how do you constrain the activities of uh, corporations in such a way that we develop these technologies uh, responsibly, ethically, transparently in a manner that's audible and that's, uh, you know, uh, acutely aware of and sensitive to the potential harms that might be caused by these technologies. So what we are uh, proposing is a kind of third path. A middle way, not to say that we shouldn't pursue, you know, a private development of these technologies and regulation. I think this is all, uh, you know, a great idea. Uh, there's some interesting uh, legislation coming out of the EU, uh, the AI Act that everyone is talking about that I think are interesting paths forward. But a, to really um, consolidate the international community around these technologies, we have proposed a standards-based approach. Um, and uh, the the IEEE group uh, where the standards uh, will be housed uh, is an open group. Uh, folks from anywhere can join. Uh, we have some uh, pretty high profile corporate partners. But the idea is to build these technologies in a manner uh, where we avoid silos, basically, and where we can kind of coordinate the entire world's techno technological and intellectual prowess towards solving these uh, issues. So I, I think the um, and and yeah, there has been definitely um, uh, the threats of AI, the the risk mm. of AI have been uh, quite quite heavily quite heavily discussed. Um, as I think as with our, good reason. Listeners. Yeah, well, and you know, I mean, recently we had a show about this, and I was uh, pilloried, mm. you know, quite a bit uh, in the comments because of my my role as uh, devil's advocate. But I mean, I I mean, for me personally, I see the damage of of AI happening right now i mean you Absolutely. know when you have when you have kind of um let's say social media algorithms that have been highly engineered and optimized and no small part by by machine learning to suck up everybody's attention you know it's even before well before we get to the the possible point of 
of superintelligence, you know, in, in a general sense, um, uh, it's already damaging, right? Mm-hmm. And so, and, and I personally think the path forward are openness and transparency and making mm-hmm. sure that, that the good guys, um, uh, that it's easy for them to do the right thing. And so mm-hmm. I think, I think like approaches like what you're advocating for the right way to go. I mean, well, for sure, thank you for, because thank the you, genie's uh, not going back in a bottle. It, it isn't. And, um, I think, you know, you, you, you said that all the right words, transparency, I think is, is more than just, um, transparency in the decision-making of stakeholders and parties involved in the research and development of AI technologies. In our case, it really means the transparency. In addition, it means the transparency of the models that we're using, right? Uh, so, you know, right, one right. approach, one approach to training up AI systems might be, uh, you know, give AI, uh, access to extremely curated data sets so that it, it learns only the right things, you know, for, in, in extremely like controlled settings. Um, there's reason to think that that won't generalize easily. Another thing that you can do yeah. is to equip your system with the capacity to form inferences about its its own inferences uh, and to evaluate itself with respect to, you know, things that we value. So you could, for yeah, yeah. instance, design an AI that had an explicit notion of like discriminatory bias and then train it to identify discriminatory bias in data sets, for example. And, you know, uh, you can use active inference technologies to allow the system to access and report on its own inferences. Uh, well, and I our- mean, it's, it's even more general than, than that, I think, mm. if I'm understanding correctly, because, for example, you have these nodes, right, in this, in this um, hyperspace. You, have the, mm-hmm. you know, you have, you have all these nodes in there. And, and you can learn, for example, that, say, a particular node uh, is, is racist. You know, it, like it'll it'll give you That's great right. answers to a particular question, so long as it doesn't think you have certain you know demographic characteristics or, or whatever, and then it gives you like you know bad answers. Well, then you can you, the network can learn how to mitigate against that. It can learn how to you know compensate for the biases like inherent in, in nodes. So not just and, the data and, sets, in but the actual uh, algorithms. Yeah, exactly. And, uh, you know, the algorithms that we're using are based on explicitly labeled generative models. So these are systems that can be audited by third parties. Uh, right, right, right. Because everything is labeled explicitly, right? So, like, you, you can really calculate the incidence of this or that node on this or that part of the inference. And it gives you a kind of tractable, uh, interpretable, uh, you know, auditable method of constructing systems Uh such that you understand what went into the decision-making process. Uh, I said earlier that uh, my suspicion, our wager, is that active inference will be to the 2020s what uh, reinforcement learning was to the 2010s. Mm-hmm. M- my my gut tells me that if legislation, the legislation that, that they are uh, you know writing up in the U.S. and in the EU uh, goes through. Uh, it may be that active inference will be the only set of AI technologies that we're allowed to use uh, in the sense that, um, so, you know, uh, neural nets as they're used right now are black boxes. They're not explicitly labeled and they are built to be black boxes. Like the, the, they are not built, they're not designed to be interpretable. The, um, the kind of, uh, you know, these kind of uh, privacy, security, uh, issues, issues around confabulation, issues around, you know, the, the uninterpretability of these models. These are not like bugs in some sense. They are features of the approach that we're using to design the systems. Uh, mm-hmm. You're not using an explicitly labeled model. There is no way to render this tractable post hoc. Uh, whereas if you start from an, an, an approach that, you know, it's, it's explainable, it does what it says on the tin, then you get around these these uh, these issues uh, through your choice of architecture, in effect. Um, so you know, I, I think there's a, you know tremendous ethical import to yeah. the, the manner in which we're designing these systems. We care a lot about ethics at versus, as we discussed. My, my PhD, even though most of my publications are in computational uh, neuroscience and kind of theoretical biophysics, you might say, like my PhD is in philosophy. Uh, we're, we have a lot of properly trained ethicists really at the core of this team. And we take these 
things really seriously uh, right. at Versus. Uh, so there, there's no accident here. Uh, and I really think that active inference uh, plus the standards-based approach uh, is how you're going to get something like responsible, scalable, ethical AI. Okay, so and so far I'm on board with everything everything I've heard. But I have a question for you though, which is if it's all open and mm -hmm. and ethical, and you're trying to do the the right thing, how exactly is that profitable? Like what That's you know what, what's going to keep the the lights on it uh, versus. Well, so we have our own in-house implementation of HSML. Um, so, okay. you know, we okay. uh, we are providing the standards so that anyone can build uh, a version of HSML. We're providing the kind of core infrastructure uh, for, uh, you know, domain registry and this kind of stuff. Uh, but we also have, you know, very advanced, highly engineered and developed versions of these things that can actually do things. Um, so, uh, yeah, okay. uh, yeah, yeah. I mean, uh, you can think of, uh, you know, Red Hat and the Linux foundation as a kind of similar, uh, sure. aspirational model, right? So, uh, you know, Red Hat do generate a profit from a commercial point of view that Linux is still open source. The Linux foundation is the open source custodian of the Linux operating system. Uh, and yet they are able to operate. Uh, our contention is that our stack is organized in a similar manner, where uh, the Spatial Web Foundation is the uh, custodian of these open standards that we are, uh, you know, distributing, hoping uh, everyone will widely adopt them. And we are the more kind of hard-nosed um, kind of architects uh, who know how to build things using these tools, uh, who, who for having built them know how they, they work. Uh, and, you know, we are probably at this point, I mean, almost certainly the world's premier active inference research and development group. So uh, there's a whole powerhouse of, you know, of well, there, thinking. There's, there's a lot of great academic papers that <laughs> that uh, that come out of there. I mean, you know, I know Tim and I have enjoyed um, looking at, uh, you know, quite a few of them. Um, well, thank you. you know. Yeah, you mentioned uh, Dalton, you know, earlier. I mean, you know, there there's an example of some of some very refined and and quite deep philosophically mm. and mathematically, you know, papers, right? Well, we, we have basically hoovered up the kind of core uh, luminaries of the active inference tradition as it stands currently. I mean, Carl Friston himself is our chief scientist and is, is joining us uh, in an increasing capacity over the next few years. Uh, mm. Yeah. Uh, so when you combine that with, you know, I, I, I'm fairly uh, well known in, in the field. Uh, you know, we have really scooped up like, uh, you know, the Lance da Costa, Connor Hines, Brennan Klein, uh, Mao Albarison. It's, it, it, uh, there's a <laughs> the, uh, it, it's 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 pretty um, sometimes it's a little bit. Uh, I guess the it's, lunches it's almost... must be must be interesting there, right? <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Uh, yeah, and, and so, I mean, um, this was this was my dream, uh, you know, back back in academia to uh, have a centralized research group with with all of this talent able to like work together. And yeah, uh, we're definitely doing some interesting stuff. And at, you know, at Versus, we are committed to uh, continuously also contributing to. Uh, the public domain and open scientific uh, publication, uh, as you said, you know, we're we're a fairly productive research group. Uh, we published a few dozen papers last year, for example. Uh, you yeah. know, so we uh, w I think there's a way of striking the balance between uh, contributing to an open community of development, having an open core and this kind of thing on the one hand, um, and also being able to continue existing as a profit generating entity on the other. Uh, but really the, I think the, the key strategy is this open core, right? So like have the standards open, yeah, yeah. make sure that the everyone wall. can contribute to it. Like, uh, you know, there, there is a kind of selfish dimension to it as well, because then we are able to harness the entire power of the, int the intellectual international community, uh, you know, to, to build this, yeah. uh, stuff out. I think that, yeah, there, 
there are there are certainly some advantages. Uh, we also, uh, for instance, uh, maintain and contribute to the PyNDP package, uh, which is a Python package to, for uh, uh, partially observable Markov decision processes that power a lot of the active inference technology. Uh, so we use that as our core. Um, yeah. and it's, uh, it, it's on an open, uh, license. So uh, anyone can just, you know, download these packages, go to the GitHub, uh, and use it. So we're trying to build these technologies such that, you know, everyone can start to use them. Uh, but we definitely have, uh, you know, some key, uh, differentiators and I, I think a pretty, uh, pretty uh, unshakable market advantage. Uh, well, so. So, so speaking of market advantage, let me um, ask you about this question, which is, uh, as, as you know, we've had, we've had uh, Professor Friston on the show a couple of times. We've talked about the free energy principle a few times. And, and there seems to be um, a lot of, uh, what's the right way to say this, you know, misunderstanding or even mm-hmm. negative press, you know, if you will, not, you know, around the free energy principle, right? Like, like just kind of push mm-hmm. back against it as either something of, of, of trivial, trivial interest or, you know, a, a tautology that's, that's of no value. And we talked about some of this too in our, in our intros. So like, what if any, what do you think the biggest misconceptions are about the free energy principle and or active inference that, that really acts, you know, potentially just intellectual barriers to the adoption mm. of the technology. And this is your paper, I believe is, you know, the map fallacy fallacy, right? Which is this, this enduring kind of um, difficulty in understanding that a system can, can follow these dynamics. Okay. It can, it can, it can behave as if it can behave as if it has beliefs, right. About the world and a model about the world and it can behave in those ways. Um, and it's okay to point that out. Like, it's okay to say, yes, this thing is behaving as if it has beliefs. I'm not literally saying that it's like mm. a conscious mind, you know, that has, has beliefs. What we're saying is that if it continues to exist, it must have, have these behaviors mm. so that it doesn't dissipate into mm. equilibrium. Right. Are you so like, your what finger was on one the, of the crux? Core... Yeah. I think that that's really, maybe the, 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 the most important confusion that people have is they, they think of the free energy principle as some part of like philosophy or metaphysics, but it's not metaphysics. It's just physics. It's physics, physics. Uh, it's okay. mathematical physics in some sense. Uh, so, you know, uh, this isn't really a, a statement about the way that how, how things really are in some kind of deep kind of philosophical sense. It's about how we can come to know them given the kind of mo- the kinds of modeling tools that we can deploy uh you know so it there there is this kind of deflationary aspect to the free energy principle uh like it it is a way of writing down canonical models for the dynamics of systems that we find interesting given our state of knowledge about it uh it's it's not it's not necessarily going to tell you about the ultimate nature of mind or something like that, unless you take a super deflationary approach and you think that physics in at the end of the day will be able to tell us everything we need to know about the mind. Uh, so yeah, what, well, what do makes you, do this? You, do you think that? Um, yeah, the 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 physicist in me wants to say yes. The philosopher in me wants to say there are still a few issues that we <laughs> we need to sort out. Uh, like, uh, you know, where does consciousness come from? But we're working on it, again, using the free energy principle. Uh, I think one of the things that makes this difficult is that the free energy principle uh, is um, ontological. So it's about things, but it's not metaphysical in the sense that it's not about like these fundamental philosophical principles that tell you about thingness. It is a, it is a theory of every thing without being a theory of everything. Do you see what I mean? Um, right. Well, I think it, you hit upon this earlier, which is, um, I don't know if it's the only example, I, but as far as I know, it's the only one I know of an example that directly ties physics to, to inference or to, mm. you know, belief updating. Like this, mm. this is the first example that, 
that that I know of. So like you mm. just said, you know, it is it is a physics principle and it just so happens to correspond to Bayesian updating. That's right. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah, or approximate Bayesian variational stuff, uh which is to say basically the same thing. Um I'm I'm being a bit cautious here because I don't I, for those of you who uh in, in our audience follow me on Twitter, you'll know that I have uh to put it diplomatically, some reservations about some of the recent literature that's been published on the free energy principle. I think a lot of the issues with the literature is sociological. Um, it's, you know, and uh, it's difficult to talk about this without seeming like, you know, a bit like deprecating or negative. But like a lot of this work was uh, written, especially the critical work was written by early career researchers uh, who did not necessarily have the formal familiarity with the free energy principle that might have been required. So, I mean, look, uh, uh, for example, um, I, I, I heard a lot, you know, circa 2017, 2018, 2019, you know, uh, people say, well, you know, the free energy principle can't be true because uh, some systems maximize uh, their entropy, right? They, they move towards more entropic states. Uh, uh, now, from the from the the perspective of our conversation, that might seem nonsensical because we've just spent like you know about an hour and a half talking about how the free energy principle is a way to write down maximum entropy. Uh, but um, yeah, the, the 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 free energy principle says something very specific, right? It says that if I maximize the entropy of my beliefs, then I can keep the thermodynamic entropy of my physical states at bay. But these kind of sophisticated kind of hinge statements are not necessarily fully appreciated. So it can lead some people to right, right. just say false things about the free energy principle. Um, well, you just you just made another statement that I don't I don't know that it's hinge, but it requires paying careful attention. You said something to the effect of you know the free energy principle is a theory of all things, but it's not a theory of everything. That's right. And and I think and the way I interpreted you there was to say that like. The free energy principle applies to all things, but it doesn't necessarily tell you everything about all things. That's right. Right? Is that is that what you meant? Yeah. And, yeah. Um, you know, like, uh, I, I think that there there are some states of affairs uh, that are just not, that are not directly free energy principle adjacent. Um, sure. So I yeah. still don't know why, you know, the so-called hard problem of consciousness, right? Why does red feel like red why does a middle c sound like a middle c but it also seems to act as a kind of lightning rod that, that attracts <laughs> you know multidisciplinary criticism <laughs> mm. let's let's say it that that way and, and in fact um you know so we we over the course of, of kind of studying up on the free energy principle you know we've we've read critiques right mm. of the of it you know so for example um those by beal and, and others mm. and, and i'm wondering like what you think about the criticisms of it, you know, do you, do you find validity in them? Do you find, do you find the quality of the criticisms to be good? Has, has the FEP just moved on from it? Like what's, what's kind of the state of the art, if you will, of, of criticism of the, of the FEP? Well, the first thing to say is that we appreciate, uh, the critical engagement, uh, that the free energy principle uh, has received. Uh, and you know, like any good, scientific framework uh it, it stands to benefit from serious uh adversarial engagement um hmm. uh i think the quality of criticisms varies quite widely in the literature so to take the uh example of uh you know beale and colleagues uh i the paper i think the paper you're referring to is a technical critique of some parts of the Correct. free energy principle yeah uh yeah. it it was a very i think important paper when it came out uh it pointed out some of the um inconsistencies uh in the way that the free energy principle had been formalized circa 2012 2013 or so um and i mean since then uh the mathematics has been uh, corrected um, and I think we've moved uh, beyond the criticism. Uh, I, I have this uh, directly from Martin Beale himself. He says, you know, my, my paper, the, the, the lesson to draw from this paper is that you should incite uh, Friston's 2013 paper, Life <laughs> as We Know It, to make claims about the free energy principle, which is fair. Um, 
On the flip side, I would say that we have moved uh, beyond the formulation as it was, as it stood in 2013. One thing to keep in mind is that, uh, so the FEP is sort of like brain physics or mind physics, depending on how you want to think about it. And uh, physics and mathematics have a strained relationship uh, that I think is important to think about. So um, the history of, uh, you know, developments in physics often uh, goes as follows. Uh, a physicist, uh, you know, borrows some tools from mathematicians more or less, uh, you know, rigorously, uh, applies the tool to explain a bunch of interesting phenomena. Uh, but then that leaves mathematicians wanting. Um, so for example, you know, uh, the Dirac Delta function, uh, mm -hmm. was introduced in the context of quantum mechanics. Uh, and the, the Delta function is this weird probability function, uh, that concentrates all of the probability mass under one outcome. Uh, so you, you got like basically a probability of one for one outcome and then zero everywhere else. When Dirac introduced uh, this measure into the literature, statisticians were not pleased. It just didn't seem to them to be a well-behaved object. And it took a couple of decades of work in mathematics and statistics to make sense of and kind of tame uh, you know, the Dirac measure. Um, and uh, yeah, you often get this. You can think of a lot of the history of recent theoretical physics as this kind of back and forth between like sloppy uh, mathematical physics that gets then tightened by uh, some rigorous mathematical work. And I, I think, you know, we're in a kind of similar back and forth here um, where, you know, the FEP was effectively developed as a kind of brain physics or math physics. And uh, what we are witnessing now is an attempt to uh, rederive all of the core theorems in terms of more well-established mathematics uh, and effectively recapturing all of the core intuitions, uh, but within a kind of mathematical receptacle that, uh, you know, passes the uh, mathematical smell test, as it were. Uh, but you know, like, what's interesting, too, about uh, the, the Dirac delta function, and, and correct me if I'm wrong here, but I think, um, I don't know if it was the first, but it, it definitely helped to push along what later became known as generalized functions, mm -hmm. right? So, so it mm -hmm. at least spurred some significant, you know, work and research in mathematics, right? Oh, absolutely. And, and the FEP is similar in that, you know, we're now working out... Uh, you know, some some cool stuff uh, having to do with, you know, generalized coordinates um, and uh, mm. things like maximum caliber, which are which is like maximum entropy, but over paths. Uh, and all of this investigation is, in effect, opened up by the free energy principle uh, and, and by the can of worms. <laughs> so so were... I've, I've never heard I've never heard of maximum caliber, but let me see if I can guess what that is. So if you have paths going through you know some state space it, i guess it's like the the you know the uh the cross section the cross sectional area the paths that they traverse or, or what it's it's more like um well it's similar to that but you're what you're basically doing is uh you're considering um the entropy not of individual states but of entire paths throughout the system so uh, it, it's it's actually the entropy of the whole path. Okay. And okay. so, yeah, uh, it, it's an extension of, uh, you know, Jane's principle of maximum entropy, uh, but in such a way that uh, we can talk about like the counterfactual histories of the system, uh, that is like all of the different paths that it can take through its state space in terms of their entropy. And then the principle of maximum caliber uh, is that the, the real path is the one that maximizes entropy. So it, it's not just about finding yourself in a in a low entropy configuration. It's about finding yourself along a path that ha has the lowest entropy. Um, yeah, and, and this uh, turns out to be important uh, because the, the free energy principle uh, evinces all of these interesting dualities uh, to the space that Jaynes is describing. Uh, so in the literature, there are uh, roughly speaking two main families of application of the free energy principle, uh, the so-called density dynamics formulation uh, and the uh, path-based or path integral formulation. Um, in the density dynamics formulation, what you're considering is uh, states and how surprising those states 
are per se. So uh, when you're trying to talk about that, what you do is you appeal to this construct called a generative model. Um, and the generative model is basically a joint probability density. And what it describes is the relations of dependence uh, between the variables uh, in the flow or dynamics of a system. And so in the uh, density dynamics formulation, uh, what, what the surprise is about, like I was saying, is how implausible is some configuration of states of a system. Uh, so this is different from the, uh, from the path-based formulation. Uh, in the path-based formulation, you're considering the trajectories of system over time. And given the kind of thing that uh, you are, for example, uh, then you're going to have an inertial path through your system. Just given the kind of thing that you are, you know, I'm the kind of thing that wakes up at 6 a.m. and has some coffee and then gets progressively more tired and then goes to bed at like 9 or 10. And then you, you know me so well. <laughs> <laughs> so if you're that kind of thing, then there is a characteristic or inertial path that you'll take. And in the path integral formulation, the surprisal score is the deviation from the inertial path. So uh, yeah, these are slightly different objects. And you can think about uh, dualizing these to an entropy context where, you know, in, in the density dynamics formulation, you would be talking about the entropy of states or configuration of states or indeed of the beliefs encoded by those states, or the entropy of entire paths, uh, so this caliber notion. Um, but yeah, all of these are kind of uh, joined up, and uh, as I'm sure we'll discuss a bit later, uh, yeah, yeah. yeah, the uh, yeah the, the free energy principle turns out to be uh, a way of writing down the principle of, uh, of maximum entropy. Uh, yeah, so all these things are really uh, like deeply connected, I would say. Now, uh, you know, previously I, I kind of prodded you about whether or not the physics uh, <laughs> could explain, you know, consciousness, and you said the physicist in you was really, really, uh, you know, leaning towards hoping it, hoping it could. So I, I want to take this chance while we have you to ask you about one of our favorite perennial topics on the show here, which is emergence. Mm. You know, weak emergence, um, strong emergence. Now. Um, you know, there's there's different ways of looking at it, different definitions of it. I think um, what I want to ask you, though, is that there are clearly certain behaviors, right, that are best modeled and talked about and described mathematically at these higher levels of, um, of abstraction, like thermodynamics, okay? I mean, you know, just there are these bizarre kind of properties of, you know, entropy and, and uh, temperature and free energy, uh, not... Uh, somewhat related to the free energy we've been talking about that you can that you can develop these equations on right the first law second law third law thermodynamics and they apply to these kind of bulk systems now like uh in principle in principle and that's really the 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 key word there which is in principle if you could write down all the you know details excruciating details of every particle and solve you know wave equations and kind of massive massive dimensions you may be able to uh, formulate those laws, right? And predict mm -hmm. the emergence of those laws. But the fact is nobody ever has. Like they, they, they don't do that, we can't do that. And, and there's even the possibility that in mathematics, like mathematically, these effective theories, right? Where we, you try to do that, you try to write down all the particles, mm -hmm. calculate integrals and averages, they can sometimes end up with these singularities where you can't cross you know, that divide. So I guess my question to you is is this, which is that, and if you couldn't cross the divide, that would be a strongly emergent mm. phenomenon versus a weakly emergent one where you could mathematically cross, right? Mm. So I'm just curious if you think, um, first of all, if you think there's such a thing as strongly emergent phenomenon, or if we'll always be able to cross that mathematical divide, if you will. And then secondly, even if we could, is there really any point or is it better just to develop, you know, descriptions at different levels and and just be happy with that at the end mm. of the day that's a really great insightful question um i would be inclined to say that the free energy principle gives you a kind of heuristic or a map to tame weak emergence um so maybe we, we could start there for a second so the free energy principle applies sure. in a kind of uh, multi-scale 
manner to uh, things composed of things composed of things. And the kind of key insight um, that you get from the study of ensemble dynamics uh, in the free energy principle is that um, things can engage in emergent behavior provided that they have a shared generative model. So it, if, if you and I kind of encode the same dependency structures, hmm. then we are going to react in characteristically coherent ways to whatever we're experiencing. And therefore, we will end up coordinated, even if we're not directly communicating. So the, there is a story that you can tell. And I know you've had Mike Levin on the call here, uh, uh, on the show here a few times. Yep. Uh, yep. Yeah, he's, he's absolutely amazing. So the, this kind of like, um, yeah, ensemble behavior that Mike is interested in explaining has to do with the emergence of a shared generative model. Um, so this, again, uh, it's, it's the same core story. You know, you have things interacting over time. And the, the FEP says that if there are boundaries in the system between things, then they will track each other across the boundaries, right? So this means that over time, things end up sharing a generative model and can then begin to display uh, coordinated shared patterns of behavior. Um, so I think that's really key. Um, the, you know, and we, we discussed, um, Aristotle a bit earlier. This is again, removing degrees of freedom from the parts, right? If you and I are aligned on what this or that means, it means that we're aligned on what this or that doesn't mean. So we are, you know, coordinating by uh, becoming models of each other, becoming good predictors of each other, kind of sparsifying the set of things that we expect each other to do. And over time, we can arrive at some form of like, uh, you know, coordinated behavior. And I think the, the contention is that this explains, you know, biophysical emergence at every scale where we observe it. Um, so there, there's an argument to be made that really this is, really a theory, like a, a formal theory of, uh, well, I mean, the, the, the FEP itself is not a theory, as we discussed, it's a principle, but it's a formal approach to that begins to give you a grip on how to model nested systems of systems of systems of systems. Uh, the cool thing is that the whole stack operates on the same quantity, basically. So you have one objective function. Uh, it's the same pattern at every scale. It's the Markov blanket that repeats. Uh, and it's this uh, free energy minimization behavior, um, you know, and uh, so that's, I think, powerful. Uh, it, you know, this segues one of the applications of the uh, free energy principle uh, at Versus is to design um, systems that are able to perform inference at different scales using the same uh, objective function, so the, the variational free energy. and if you introduce this time scale separation into the mix, then uh, you know at the bottom of the stack you have state inference, right? So uh, I have hypotheses about what might be causing my data. I, I am generating uh, data through my actions, and I, I end up selecting the hypothesis that accords the best uh, with the data that I'm generating. But you can do your parameter learning using exactly the same uh, architecture, just on a slower time scale. Right, so you accumulate counts of state estimation, and then over time you're able to, uh, you know, estimate what the best configuration and value of your parameters are for your model. And then similarly, you could do the exact same exercise at the level of the entire model's structure. And then, you know, that's right. where you get into uh, the natural selection story that the free energy principle brings to the table. I embody a model. In my existence, I am kind of generating evidence for that model. Good models persist and leave copies of themselves. Bad models are destroyed and dissipate. Uh, so you, you can really tell a kind of, I think, powerful multi-scale story. Uh, so yeah, I would say like th there's not much that remains in the weak emergence stuff that you can't you know uh, address in a tractable manner using this kind of approach. Uh, your other question about strong emergence is a bit more vexed. Um, you know, thinking about this, I think the only thing that might really be strongly emergent is our conscious experience. 
Um, and there are reasons to think that that actually isn't strongly emergent, but just weakly emergent. Um, in particular, are, are you familiar with Andy Clark's notion of basing qualia? Uh, not, not quite. What is it? It's very cool. He calls, he calls this the meta hard problem. Um, oh, okay. Yeah. And, and what, what Andy is basically saying is that, well, uh, what we experience as qualitative sensations are just further inferences, namely inferences that I am feeling this. Right, right. Well, that's so. that's very similar. You know, I, I really liked um, Professor Friston's take on this, and I'm I'm blanking on on the uh, on the article where he described this, but but he said that you know when you when you're doing this free energy principle and you're doing this this inference, once your once your inference has reached a sufficient temporal depth and counterfactual depth, if you will, mm. then that's when consciousness can emerge because it can start to model itself and its own internal states and, you know, this sort of thing. I think it makes a lot of sense. Um, I, Absolutely. I don't, yeah. Yeah. Well, you know, you're, you're preaching to the choir here. Obviously I find that kind of explanation extremely compelling. Um, yeah. And so, you know, uh, we also have some interesting, in my view, uh, work on consciousness that, that we have, uh, you know, uh, uh, in a free energy principle adjacent, uh, Kind of area I've been putting out for you know nearly two decades, but more recently we've been looking at the question whether you can uh, derive a theory of consciousness directly from the free energy principle. Um, and so we believe that we can. And th the idea there is that um, consciousness corresponds to something like an inner Markov blanket, so an inner screen. Um, so to back up just a little bit. Um, uh oh, you, uh oh! You said inner screen. Now yeah. people are going to think of the humunculus. Well, know, so uh, that's why I want to qualify this carefully. Um, you can think of any Markov blanket as a screen of sorts. So it, it is um, a screen in well, the and you mean a screen in like a mathematical sense. Yeah, exactly. Like, like yeah, in, yeah. in the sense of the uh, holographic principle uh, in physics, right? So the holographic principle is a principle uh, that originated in black hole thermodynamics. And it relates to uh, our ability to encode information uh, within a system. And what it basically says is that you can, from, from the perspective of an outside observer, a given system can only contain as much uh, observable information as you can fit onto its boundary. Um, the reason being that if that, if that bulk collapsed into a black hole uh, and there were more information than that, uh, then it, it, you classical information would be destroyed fit. in the process. Yeah. yeah, exactly. And you would violate basically the principle of unitarity in quantum mechanics. So, uh, I, you know, I mentioned this quantum information theoretic formulation of the free energy principle that I said I wouldn't get into, but it's probably worth getting into for like two minutes. Um, so mm -hmm. according to this formulation, you can think of the Markov blanket as a kind of holographic screen that separates the inside of a system from its environment. And it's, it's a slightly more kind of computational take on what we've been talking about. So, uh, you know, the active and sensory states of the Markov blanket would correspond to uh, reading and writing onto the screen uh, or a measurement and preparation operations in a kind mm -hmm. of quantum mechanics uh, perspective. Okay, so the interesting thing about the Markov blanket in this formulation is that by definition, um, because it is constructed uh, or contains all of the degrees of freedom that a couple, uh, you know, systems across the boundary, um, all of the classical information that you need to describe the coupling lives on the boundary in some sense. So uh, Chris Fields about three years ago, uh, along with Mike Levin and Jim Glazebrook, uh, proposed that, well, maybe... Uh, the core architectural feature of systems that have consciousness uh, is an internal Markov blanket, right? The, the idea being that the classical information that I use and bring to bear in parsing my, you know, perceptual streams and deciding how to act has to live somewhere. And so the idea right. is it probably lives in this kind of internal uh, screen or Markov blanket. Interestingly, uh, there's a way of just taking this stuff that we were saying about, you know, levels in the uh, brain and just directly translating that into the Markov blanket talk. Between any two levels of brain 
architecture, there is a Markov blanket by definition, whereby these messages are being passed. So it you can basically, according to the model that we're proposing, so you have an external Markov blanket, right, that separates the uh, the internal the inside of the organism from its outside. And then if you look at the these internal states, they have this structure of a nested hologram in, in some sense, right? Where like you have a series of screens that are successively coarse graining each other and that are therefore kind of resonating with each other. And so there's a whole story that you can tell about, yeah, the the emergence of something like, uh, yeah, uh, consciousness uh, just directly from, by appealing to the free energy huh. principle. The kind of key to this architecture is that at the very top of this nested hierarchy, there is a right only layer that doesn't get further contextualized from by anything else, right? And so there's a sense in which that layer is constrained to write down and can only uh, kind of infer itself into existence vicariously by acting on the other layers of the network. Um, and so the idea then is that this is where the uh, kind of, um, well, this is how you resolve the homunculus paradox, first of all, is that the, there is a layer that, that is not observing itself. It just exists to observe right. layers below. Um, yeah. And so, yeah, we have a, a new paper that was just published. It's in a series of two or three papers that we're articulating. Um, so uh, I say this because, like, I think if, if anything is a candidate for strong emergence, the only really serious one is consciousness. And the, the, the absolutely utopian, overconfident uh, part of me thinks that, like, by uh, combining, you know, some of the philosophical work that, say, Andy Clark has done around Bayes and Qualia with these computational architectures for conscious systems that we're developing based on the free energy principle, somewhere in the vicinity of this, if you... If you, you know, if you look at it for long enough, there'll be something that, that'll emerge to resolve this <laughs> issue. So, uh, well, well, I guess uh, David Chalmers will at least be happy that um, you've identified consciousness as the only, if there is something strongly emergent, it's only consciousness. So. I can't think of anything else, frankly. Um, uh, I mean... Consciousness may ultimately be inexplicable, uh, but it, it also may not. And so, you know, I, I'm uh, an optimist well, until I'm I'm proven wrong. Uh, and we're we're going to keep working on this. Uh, I think you know what we're proposing is just the the very kind of basics of a sketch of what a, a mechanism for the generation of consciousness might look like. We're very, 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 cool. very far from like a comprehensive question, but uh, yeah. So um, that's, that's weak the emergence. Funny thing about oh yeah, <laughs> go ahead. Well, I was gonna say weak, weak emergence definitely a cool idea. I think the FEP gives you some tools to handle that. Strong emergence, I, I'm not sure. Uh, like, I, I, if if anything is, it's definitely consciousness, uh, but maybe not. Okay, well, fair enough. And you know, I was gonna say. What's funny about the free energy principles, it's this onion that just keeps on giving. You can just keep mm. pulling back more and more layers. And I think we probably have, uh, I don't know, maybe centuries of mathematics, you know, uh, inspired by it, most likely. Well, yeah, I, I mean, I, I, think, I think it is one of the singular most important discoveries, like, uh, of the last maybe 200 years. Like, I think, you know, you, you you've had long discussions with Carl, so uh, <laughs> yeah, you, yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I I think this is like you know the this is physics of mind. You know, we are we are right. slow. I, I think this is the same. You know, to bring it back to mechanics. Um. So Galileo uh, basically destroyed. Uh, you know, it's the Galilean moment, right? But like Galileo destroys thousands of years of philosophy inherited from the Greeks, right? The Greeks thought that there were basically two kinds of stuff. There was the sublunar stuff and the superlunar stuff. And then the sublunar stuff was governed according to these four elements where, you know, like uh, uh, things uh, the, the, uh, that were uh, earth uh, f fell down and things that were fire rose and stuff like that, right? Uh, and the superlunar 
uh, was all about like eternal, perfect, secular, uh, cyclical, circular motions of like planets and, and so on, right? And you know, you can if you were uh, around 400 BC and you you looked up into the sky, it really would look as if there were two different kinds of things, two utterly distinct. You know the the stuff around me, you know, rocks fall to the ground and uh, smoke rises and, and water is cold and, and so on. Uh, and the stuff out there that just moves in perfect eternal spirals and so on. Um, yeah. what, what Newton and Galileo, but I mean, maybe in particular uh, Newton, end up doing is to say, well, no, actually, <laughs> uh, it's all one kind of stuff. Uh, like it, it's it's all... You know, subject to the same fundamental laws, it's it's classical mechanics, and the Newtonian kind of Galilean Newtonian moment is sort of like the split where, like, you know, the old way of thinking, yeah, uh, started to show uh, signs of being incomplete, and a new alternative arose. So it kind of unifies all of reality under the auspices of classical mechanics, and I think the same kind of thing is at play here. Where, you know, we used to think that the, there was physics and then there's biology or maybe, you know, there's and physics information and, theory. Yeah, exactly. Or, or maybe there's like physics and biology and then there's the mind. But what, what the FEP is ultimately telling us, and I, 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 you, you've heard this, you know, from, from Mike and Carl before, I'm sure, is that there really isn't a distinction to make here. Like it's, it's all just you know, physics in some sense. And biology is just slow physics. And mm. psychology is just even slower physics. And culture is just even slower physics. And so, yeah, I think uh, we have the same kind of like radical quantum leap in the way that we, uh, you know, are able to think about the world that opens up with the free energy principle, especially when you combine this to like the philosophy of sparseness and emptiness that I was referring right. to a bit earlier. Like, right. I think what emerges out, out of this is like a real powerful constellation to, to think about the way that intelligence is expressed in physical systems. And, you know, that's also why Versus uh, has adopted the approach. Like here is finally we have the physics of intelligence. So let's let's build our AI systems on these well, bases. This, I mean, it, it hits exactly the phrase that, that you said that it's so impactful and meaningful, which is the whole is not greater than the sum of the parts. Exactly. It's radically less right? than the sum of the parts. It's beautiful. Well, listen, Maxwell, it has been absolutely a pleasure to have you on. So thank you so much for uh, taking the time to join us and, um, and talk. And, you know, I hope you come back on again. It seems like there's so much to discuss. I'd love to. And, you know, I, I am a, a longstanding fan of your podcast. So this was oh, thank you so much. Both, uh, no, really, uh, genuinely, this was uh, a pleasure and also an honor. Uh, so thank you very much for having me. Um, and this discussion was extremely exciting and fun. And uh, yeah, let's do this again sometime. I, I, I'd love to come back. Absolutely. And best of luck at Versus. I'm uh, <laughs> supportive of what you're doing there. Very glad to hear it.